There are only two hard problems in computer science, naming things, cache invalidation, and off by one errors. Maybe you've heard that joke before, because another problem with programming is that we only have one joke and it's not very funny. But there is some truth in the original joke, and that's the fact that caching can be extremely difficult. And the Next.js JavaScript framework is the poster child for these modern challenges. A few weeks ago, Vercel released Next.js 15, and it comes with all kinds of awesome new features, like tools to automatically migrate code, a fast or turbo pack dev server and a new API to run code in the background after a request is complete, but the biggest change is that they totally overhauled the way caching works. And to be honest, it's pretty awesome, and that's what we'll look at in this video. By default, everything is cached in Next.js, like a server component that defines a web page, and also any calls you make to the fetch function would be cached by default to try to optimize performance by preventing the server from doing extra work and re-rendering the same page over and over again. The problem is that in some cases you might have multiple data fetch operations to render a page. You might want some of them to be cached, but you might want others to be revalidated on every request. And opting out of the cache could be pretty annoying. There's a few different ways to do it, like adding the cache no store option to fetch, or by exporting this force dynamic variable, or by setting the cache control headers manually. It's kind of a mess and easy to run into problems where your data is not updating because it's being cached and you have no idea why. The good news is that in Next15, things are becoming far more intuitive with a new API called Dynamic IO, which allows you to cache or not cache anything, while also simplifying your code and making it far more explicit. To demonstrate how this works, let's look at some code. I'm here in a brand new Next.js project, but currently this feature is experimental, so let's enable it by adding dynamic IO to the Next config. And as of today, we'll also need to be on the Next.js Canary version, which you can update to with these commands. And optionally, you'll notice that I'm using Dino here instead of Node.js because they have some cool utilities that we'll look at later, but that's totally optional. If you want to learn more about Dino, my full course is now available, and I also just updated my Next.js course. And if you're watching this before December 1st, 2024, you can use the Black Friday discount to get access to everything at 40% off. But now let's take a look at the new caching system in Next.js. Let's imagine we have an application that needs to display a product description and price. To to simulate that, I've created this utility here that has a separate function for get product and get price. I'm using the library Faker.js to generate some fake data, which you can think of as data you would fetch from a database. Interesting backstory on Faker.js, a few years ago, the original developer intentionally corrupted this project to break a bunch of people's apps on purpose as a statement against open source abuse and lack of funding. It actually made it into the mainstream news and was the story that motivated me to start the code report series on the main channel. Ultimately, it didn't work out too well for him, and they took over the project and now it's maintained by someone else. In this demo, Faker.js is really useful because it makes it easy to tell which data is cached and which is not. Now from there, I'm creating a page on the store route, inside of which we have a server component. Inside that component, we get the product and price synchronously and then render it in the HTML. If we go ahead and serve the application, you'll notice in the browser that every time I refresh the page, I'm getting a new product price and description. That's because currently this page is not cached and Next.js will re-render every time we refresh. But now let's make this a little more realistic by going back into our database file then make our data fetching functions async. To make it even more realistic, I'll bring in this delay function from Dino to provide a one second delay to simulate latency in the database. Then from there I'll go back into the product page and make this server component async and add a wait to our function calls. And now if we go back into the browser, you'll notice that it renders, but we also get this error. What this error is telling us is that we need to make a choice. We either need to cache or pre-render this page, or we need to make it dynamic explicitly by wrapping it in a suspense bound. Boundary. Let's first assume that we want this page to be dynamic and refetch the data on every request. To clear the error, the first thing we'll need to do is wrap it in suspense, and we can do that easily in Next.js by simply creating a loading file that exports a component. This is basically the equivalent of using suspense in the parent layout. But now if we go back to the application, you'll notice that the error is cleared, and we get fresh data on every request. But now let's assume that we don't want dynamic data and would rather cache our data. Well, we can easily accomplish that by simply adding the use cache directive to the top of this page. Use cache is a Next.js specific feature and not directly related to React.js, but what you'll notice is that when we go to the browser now, we get fresh data on the first renderer, but then get that same data every time we refresh the page, and that will continue until the cache expires. And that's a good question, when does the cache expire? Well, currently, the default is an infinite cache that's revalidated every 15 minutes, which you'd want for content that doesn't change on a regular basis, like your about page. But what if we want to change the caching behavior? Well, there's a new cache life function that we can import from Next.js 
which we can then use inside the body of the function to change the caching behavior to a variety of different defaults. Like in this case, we might only want to cache it for a few hours if the product description or price has the potential to change on a daily basis. And if these defaults aren't good enough for you, you can fully customize them to your own values in the next config. But if that's still not good enough for you, you can also invalidate the cache on demand, which is made possible with this cache tag function. You provide the function with a key that's used to identify a cached value. And that means that at some later point, maybe in a couple minutes or a couple years, you can invalidate the cache when the underlying data changes. Like typically that would happen when you update a record in the database that would impact what's presented to the user in the UI. Pretty cool, although at this point we've only looked at ways to cache an individual route. But this use cache directive provides us with far more flexibility than that. For example, we might have multiple components in a single file. And if we put use cache at the top of that file, all the components will inherit the same behavior. If that's not desired though, we can move the directive inside of individual components to choose exactly which ones we want to opt in. The most powerful feature though is its ability to cache individual functions and server actions. If we go back into the db.ts file, we can actually implement different caching behavior for each function. Maybe our product description is static and almost never changes, so let's put the use cache directive there. In contrast, the price might be highly dynamic, so let's leave that one as is. Now let's go back to our component and figure out how to use multiple levels of caching on a single page. First, make sure to remove the use cache directive from the top, then we'll extract the price UI and data fetching logic into its own component. This component will fetch and render the price in the UI just like before, but the key difference is that we wrap that component in suspense in the parent. What this will do is allow the rest of the page to render immediately, while only the price remains suspended in a loading state. And that's awesome, because otherwise we would have to wait for the price before rendering anything on the page. But now, as you can see in the demo, the user gets most of the content, like the product description, while the price finishes rendering in the background. And that's especially powerful on things like dashboards, where you're loading multiple different data sources all of which have different degrees of latency. Congratulations, now that you understand use cache and suspense, that's everything you'll need to memorize for caching in Next15. It's usually a good thing when an API decreases in complexity, but as of today, dynamic I.O. is still experimental. Caching is still hard, but I think this is a step in the right direction. However, in a big project, this code might get kind of crazy. Like your code base will have use client, use server, and now use cache everywhere. Then you might implement the new using keyword in JavaScript to use the new React use hook, then combine them all to create your own use using directives and hooks, at which point your code will be utterly useless. But one other cool thing about Next15 is that it now also supports React 19 and the compiler, the React compiler, which eliminates the need for annoying hooks like use memo and use callback. It's another step in the right direction, but is still very experimental today. But most importantly, these features are designed to provide job security by giving React developers a never-ending supply of legacy code to update. If React 19 ever comes out someday, expect a full course on Fireship IO, and when that day comes, you'll already have access to it if you're a lifetime member. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.